All right, hello again. This is Jeff Scott from Rankin Technical College. I've been going over the PowerPoint presentations for the Ferrell C Sharp 2015 An Introduction to Object Oriented Programming Text. And starting in the last chapter, what I did first before going over the notes was to write a program or two, I guess. Um, wrote both a graphical and a non-graphical program. And I think I'm going to do that again for this chapter. Chapter 4 is on the selection statement. And if you don't know what that means, it's kind of how we live our lives. You know, you get up in the morning and you decide, do I feel well enough to go into work or into school or do I not? Type of an idea. So it's an if, kind of an if statement. So we're going to go over those, but let's start this by, in fact, I'm going to leave that up there. And I'm just going to start up Visual Studio 2015. And I'm going to do a file, new project, and first we will do a GUI project. So I'm going to call this Payroll GUI. I don't think I have one called Payroll GUI. Of course, if I did, I'd be getting an, a message right now telling me and asking me if they wanted me to overwrite that. All right, let's move this. We'll pull this out so it's a little bit bigger. One of the first things, or a couple of the first things I like to do when I get to just having the form here is, first of all, I don't like the background color. So let's make it, oh, what haven't I used? Let's make it a, like a nice green, for lack of better words. All right, and let's change a couple things on here. I don't like the text that says Form 1. So I'm going to say, uh, pay, uh, how about this, GUI Payroll Program Chapter 3. It's good enough. And you can see how that's changed up here. Now that just changed the text. Let's go and find the name property also. If you haven't noticed this already, any property that's set like this is always going to be bolded. All right, so sometimes that can make it easier for you when you're looking for things. So I'll call this form GUI payroll CH3. Kind of a long name, but it's pretty indicative of what's going on here. All right, so I'm going to build my interface. I'm going to have three labels. One, two, three. We'll pretty them up in just a minute. I'm going to have three text boxes, one for each label. There's one, there's two, there's three. So I've got that. And I'm also going to have, um, hmm, I'll have three buttons. So I'm going to put those right down below. So I'm going to put that here. There's button one, kind of center it. It's not perfect, but it's not bad either. All right, another button below that and still another button below that. So now I'm pretty much done painting my interface, except these labels are not nearly wide enough. So again, I, I hold down on the left mouse button and start to drag, and that's called lassoing them. So I've lassoed those three labels. I'm going to come down here and I'm gonna find the property that says auto size, and I'm gonna set it from true to false, which means I can make these bigger. Right. So there's, again, it's just about there. There we go. I don't want them to touch though. Move these over just a tad. There. All right. So now I have these and I have these. Now this one, when you look here, Looks like it's I've centered it on, or on the top, and so is so with that one and with that one. So I think that's pretty good. So the first thing I'm going to do is, as I've told you, is I'm going to rename everything. So I'm going to call this one here. The name will be Label Hours Worked. Okay, and the actual text for that will be Hours worked, not world, worked. 
All right. And I'm going to play with this in just a minute. I'm going to make the font bigger and I'm going to move it to the right so it'll look a little bit nicer than it does right now in just a couple of minutes. All right. Now for my second button, I'm going to call, say, put here hourly rate. And again, I want to change the name to label hourly rate. And then finally, this last button right, or I'm sorry, last label right here will be called label gross pay. And the text it will have is gross pay. All right, so I've changed all those for my labels now, but now I'm gonna lasso them one more time. And I'm gonna do a couple things. I'm gonna go up to the font property right here and click that. I like to make mine about, about 12 point. Okay, you can see it's already looking a little bit nicer. I want it bolded, so where it says bold, I can either click here and click the down arrow and choose true, or I can just double click where it says false and it'll change it, you can see that. The next thing I wanna do is I wanna go and find where it says text align, it says top left, I wanna change that to right justified in the middle. Okay, and you can see now it's starting to really come together, I think at least, it's looking nicer. Okay, not perfect, but it's looking better. So since this is called label hours worked, label hourly rate, and label gross pay, this will now be text box hours worked, text box hourly rate, and text box gross pay. So I'm gonna change those next. There's no text in there, so all I have to change for these is the name. So text box hours worked, Right? It's not mandatory that you make them the same type of name as the labels. I like to do that because to me it just makes sense. Text box, hourly rate. And then finally, text box, gross pay. All right, I'm getting there. So my first button, <clears throat> I'm going to call that button calculate. And I'm, for the text, I'm going to change it from button one to the word calculate. All right, the second one is going to say, for the text, it's going to say clear. And as you'd probably guess, its name will now be button clear. And the last one, the name will be button exit. <clears throat> and I will change the te text on it to exit. All right, so now I pretty much have my interface built. What I'm gonna do first is I'm gonna come back here, let's see, let's, let's highlight these, and I'm going to make them smaller. You'll see why in a second. All right, so that's smaller. So now I can come over here and highlight these and move it over just a tad. I'm gonna move them all over at once. All right, then I'm gonna do the same thing here. Whoops. If I make a mistake like I just did, Control Z will undo it. So that's, whoops, oh, well, didn't wanna put anything in the load event, but that's okay. All right. So let's move these over. Why did I do that? Well, the screen's kind of big right now, bigger than it has to be. So I'm gonna make it a, what I consider to be a nicer size, which is right there. All right, now a couple things I wanna show you that I have not shown you before. The first is, right now you've noticed that if I run this, I can run it, so I'm gonna save and I'm gonna run it, but notice where it runs. All right, almost right over where it was before. I don't like that. I like when it runs in the middle of the screen. So I'm gonna click on the form itself and I'm going to go down here and if I come down toward the bottom, what you're gonna notice is start position. It says Windows default location. I'm gonna click on that, click the down arrow and choose center screen. Now when I run it, notice it runs right in the middle of the screen. I like that better. You may or may not agree, but you know that. So next thing I'm gonna do is I want to be able to have the tab here or here or here or here or here. I don't care about this one. It's gonna be read only in a minute. And there's no sense in trying to even tab to these. So 
I'm going to click on here and I'm going to, if you remember how I did this, I click view, tab border down toward the bottom. And this one here, I want to be zero. This one, I want to be one. This one, I want to be two, to be three, and to be four. I don't care about the rest of them. So I'm going to do another view, tab order. So now that's set. Then I'm going to again hold down on my left mouse button and lasso everything that's here. Come over to here and find the property that's called locked. This time I'll click on it and I'll click the down arrow and I'll choose true. And now this is locked. So now I can't move anything because I have my interface looking pretty much the way I want it to look. Okay. All right. Couple more things. We have not talked about this before. I don't know if and or when the author even talks about these in the book, but I'd like it so that if I hit the enter key at any time, that button is going to execute. And if I hit the escape key at any time, that button is going to execute. The way I do that is I click on the form itself and then I've got to go and look for it because I, they moved it around. But under miscellaneous, they've got accept button and cancel button. The accept button is what I want to have happen if the user presses enter, and that's calculate. So where it says none, I click there, click the down arrow, and choose button calculate. All right, for cancel button, that's going to be clear. That's what I want to have happen when you hit the escape key. All right, so now those are set. So really the only thing that's left now is to write some code. You might say, well, yeah, but that's the most important thing. And it really is because what I have done thus far here is I have built the interface. So the interface is pretty much, pretty much all done as far as I can tell. So I'm going to start writing some code right now. Again, I can double click on anything that's in here. But I want to just, another way I can bring up the code window is to right mouse click on the form and choose view code. Now, I don't want anything in this load event. I really didn't want anything there. All right. But since I've highlighted it, let's set it up and we'll double check. We'll make double sure. Even though we've already set up the, uh, the tab order, I'm going to say here text box, not text box hours worked dot focus. So that should doubly make sure that when the program begins to run and the form is loaded into memory, we'll check on it right now, that the cursor should be blinking inside of the first field. So let's see if indeed that's happening. There it is blinking. All right, so good. We're off to a good start. All right, the next thing I'm gonna do is and don't worry about this. We talk about it, I believe, but it's very late in the book. All right. All right. And I'm going to come up here now and I'm going to create a bunch of variables that I'm going to use in the program. In fact, before I do that, I'm even going to create some constants. If you remember, a constant is something that cannot change. So I'm going to say here, program constants. That's a little comment that says that. And it's const, then the type of variable. I'm going to have a double. And I'm going to call it max non OT. Oops, OT. And I'm going to set it equal to 40.0. What is that? That's the max number of hours worked with no overtime. So you work can work up to 40 hours and you get no overtime. All right, I'm also going to have another const here, which is going to be another double. And I'm going to call this OT rate. That's the overtime rate. Well, it's going to be time and a half. All right, again, I'm a little anal about this. I like this stuff to line up. Makes it just, especially when I'm starting, just makes it much easier for me to see what's going on. All right, overtime rate, time and one half. All right. So I've got all that done. So I've got my constants. Okay. Now I want to use my variables. Remember that a variable's value can change while the program is running, while a constant's value cannot change. So what do I have here? I'm going to need a variable for the hours worked. I'm going to need a variable for the hours hourly rate. 
I'm going to need one for the gross pay, and I'm going to even create another one, even though I don't need it, for my number of overtime hours. You'll see why when we get a little further on into the program. So, double hours worked equals 0, 0.0. And again, that's the hours worked. It's pretty obvious from the name. Double hourly rate. And again, we'll set that equal to 0, 0.0. All right. And as just mentioned, that will be the hourly rate, double gross pay, and I'm sure you know, that'll be the gross pay. All right, now you can put any kind of comments here you want, but what I'm gonna basically put here is hours worked times hourly rate. All right, and we won't worry about overtime. I'm just gonna leave it like that. Finally, I'm gonna have one more variable, and it's gonna be a double. I'm gonna call it OT hours. And again, I'm gonna set that equal to 0, 0.0. All right, and that will be the number of overtime hours. This variable isn't actually needed. It's not necessary. You can do the calculations without it. But I'm gonna do the, uh, uh, instead of making it one big calculation, I'm gonna make it two smaller ones. All right, so that's overtime hours. In other words, that's greater than 40, worked. Okay, so now, now I have all my constants and I have all my variables, and that's good. All right, so I've got all of that stuff done. And what I want to do now is I wanna start putting in the actual code that goes along with this, all right? Well, let's think about what we want to have happen. All right. When we click this, we want to calculate the person's gross pay. When we click this, we want to clear these three fields, and we want to put the cursor there. And when we click exit, we want the program to stop. So I'm going to click this one. Okay, and then I'm going to come back, and I'm going to click the next one. And then I'm going to come back one more time, and I'm going to click the last one. All right, the easiest one is exit. That's just application.exit. All right, and I can test that by running the program again. Oh, it says there were errors. Click no. Double gross, wow, that's pretty neat. Wow, what happened there? I don't know. That should have said That fingered something. So there's the variables, and that should come back to over here. All right, so hopefully that fixed everything. Save, and let's run it again. Now, the only thing that this doesn't work, this doesn't work because there's no code here, but when I click this, the program should end, and it does. It's a good start. So we've got our end done. So I'm doing this a little bit reverse, but that's okay. So now I wanna do the clear. So what I want to have happen is I want the text box that has the hours worked. I want that to be empty. So it's text box hours worked dot text equals double quote, double quote. Remember that makes, you know, that empties it. Sets it equal to the empty string. I want the text box hourly rate also, so the same dot text to be equal to double quote, double quote. And I want the text box for the gross pay dot text also to be equal to double quote, double quote. Okay. And then finally, I want to go and I want to grab that text box hours worked and I want to set the focus to that. So dot focus. All right. Now, I might be wrong, but I believe here that everything, everything for the clear up routine is done. So let me run it. One thing I forgot to do is make this field read only, but I'm going to do that in just a second. So again, nothing in calculate yet. Notice if I click clear, 
it all clears and there's my cursor. Good. I can click exit and that's done too. Very good. So I want to come back and I want to grab that field, that gross pay field. And I want to find the property in here that says read only and double click on it so it's true. That makes it gray and I don't like it being gray like that. So I'm going to come over here again. And what I typically do is I choose one color darker than the field. And then the background color I chose for the form. That's just the way I do it. You can do it any way you'd like. So we've got the exit done. There's our exit code. We've got our clear done. There's our clear code. So as you'd guess, what's left is to do the calculate code. All right. So let's see. And you'll notice these are all got the squigglies there, meaning that we're not using them yet. Remember, green means warning. They're not errors. They're all warnings. So, uh, let's see. Let's, let's we'll start working here. So, I'm going to put a comment here that says, I don't know, convert values in... How about value in each text box to a double? We're going to do that next. And I don't want to put a, oops, well, that's okay. And assign that value to the associated variable. Good enough. Now I can put a period in. All right. So, I want to say, hours worked, that's the variable, and that's equal to convert dot to double text box, hours worked dot text. And in English, if that confuses you, in English, what that means is, Take whatever value I put in here and attempt to convert it to a number. And then I'm going to do the same thing for this one. Okay? So. So that's the first one. I'm just going to copy this because it's pretty similar. And this will go to hourly rate. And we'll have that equal. This will also be hourly rate. All right, so that's, those are both done. Okay. Now, if I did this, this is what I want to show you now. If I did this and I said gross pay equals uh, hours worked times hourly rate. A couple things to notice here. First of all, once we do this, all right, not sure why our squigglies are still there, but they because sh they shouldn't be. There's hours worked. It says it's never used. Well, it's being used here. I don't know why that's doing that. But now if I come out and I say this, I'm gonna what I want to do is that gross pay that I just figured out, I want to stick that in here. Alright? And the easiest way for me to do that is to say text box gross pay dot text equal. Well, I want to format it, so I'm gonna say string dot format. And I want it to take the gross pay. i got to fix that. And I want it to put it to a string. And I want it to be in currency format. So let's change that from format to format. All right. Now let's take a look at what we've done. First, let's run it. Then we'll come back and kind of dissect it. So person worked 50 hours a week. They make $10 an hour. Now, I'm going to do something different here. Rather than click the Calculate button, I'm going to hit the Enter key. And notice it worked because that's my Accept button. If I want everything to clear, I could click right here. But instead, with the mouse over here, I'm going to hit the Escape key. And now that ran. All right, and I'm going to click Exit. Now, we've got a working program, and there's nothing wrong with it. Except we're not giving anybody any overtime. All right, so be, when we figure out our gross pay, when we come up here, 
let's say, determine overtime or not. All right, so if, if the hours worked, now I can say if hours worked is less than or equal to 40, I could say that, that's totally legit. But remember that value 40, we already have a field called max non-OT. And the reason that that's important is maybe later they decide to go to a 37 hour week. Now I only have to change it here, but if I'm using 40 all over the place in the program, then I've got to change it in each, in each place. All right, just was kind of a pain. So, that's fine. That now I've handled. So if hours worked less than or equal to 40, no overtime. That'll, that's what this one is handling. All right. Else, and we'll just put a comment up above here that says, hours worked greater than 40, OT pay So, I couldn't do this in one big calculation, but I decided to break it up into two because I thought it might be easier for you to understand. So, my overtime hours, that's equal to however many hours I work. Let's say I work 50. So, that's hours worked, and I want to subtract from that the 40. So, minus max non-OT. So, again, if I work 50 hours... 50 minus 40 will give me 10, and that's how much overtime I should have. All right, so now I'm gonna, and this I'm gonna break up into two lines because otherwise it'll run off the screen. So my gross pay is equal to my hourly rate times, times max non-OT, because that's again, that's, that's all the hours that I worked that were less than or equal to 40. And I want to multiply that by the hourly rate times the overtime hours times that overtime rate. Remember, that's time and a half. So let, let's do this and let's, for a second here, let's not run the program and do it, but let's do something here by hand. So if a person works 40 hours, move this over a little bit. So if they work 40 hours and they make $10 an hour, well, that's 40 times 10, so they should make $400. And I'm fairly confident that's what the program will do. But if they work 50 hours and they make $10 an hour, then what they're due is the first 40 hours, that's times 10. That's their standard pay. But then their 50 hours that they just, that they worked, I want to take those 50 hours and I want to subtract from there the 10 or the, the 40, which is their non-overtime, and I want to take that result and multiply it by their rate and then multiply that by the overtime rate. So the first 40 hours, they get it regular pay. The last 10 hours, they get it regular pay times time and a half. So this is going to come out and equal 400. And this is going to come out and equal 150. So when we get all done with this, if we did this correctly, that should be $550 that they make if they worked. So 40 times 10, if they work 40 hours, they should make $400. If they work 50 hours at $10 an hour, they should make 550. So let's check. As always, I'm gonna save, run it. So 40, 10, that's 400, that's good. 50, 
10. Oh, that was 510, so that was the arrow there was my fault. So that should be 50, 10. Well, that was goofed up. That was on me. There's an error in there someplace, but I'll fix that in a second. So let's clear and run it again. So 50, 10. All right. It says 60,000. Well, there's a big error in there someplace. So let's look at our formula. All right. That is, that's right there. It's not the hourly, well, maybe it is. Hourly rate times max non OT. Oh, it's not times that, it's plus that. So I was taking, rather than saying um, the 400 plus 150, I was saying 400 times 150. That's why I was getting the big number. Let's try it one more time. Again, 40, so no overtime, 10. All right, 400, good. 50, 10, 550. They got their overtime. All right, so that takes care of that program. All right, so that takes care of our GUI-ized program. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write this again very quickly as a console app. But what I'm going to do to try to, to save myself a little time is I'm gonna grab all the code that I've put in, everything. I'm gonna to have to make changes, of course, but I'm gonna grab all the code that I've put in here, right there. I'm gonna copy it to the clipboard, and I'm just gonna throw it into an editor so that I don't have to start from scratch. So there's all that code, okay? Then I'm gonna come back into, Vig into Visual Studio. I'm gonna do one more last save all. Then I'm going to do a file Close solution, and I'm going to do another file, um, new project, and I don't remember what I called the last one, so let's see. Let's cancel this, and we'll come right back to it. Now, I've written this before. I'm not going to lie to you, so uh, where is it? Payroll GUI? Yeah, that's what we called it. So we'll call this next one Payroll Console. All right, so File, New, Project. We want to make sure we choose Console Application. And this, again, will be called Payroll Console. All right. And first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to copy back in a bunch of the code that I, I just put in that editor. What can I use and what can't I use? I can use my constants. I can use these variables without making any changes to them. So I should be able to just copy that. Whoops. I should be able to copy that stuff in directly. So there is my, again, I'm going to get that little error message for now because there, I have not, um, I have not yet use those in the actual code. But I've got all my stuff in there. That's good. There's a start. Okay. So now what I want to do is remember I have to ask them for the number of hours they worked. So I will put in here a write statement. Now remember when I put in write, see how I get that error? And it'll come when I highlight it and it says, whoa, the name right does not exist in the current context, but it says, well, here's some fixes. Generate right, do this, use system. Well, actually, none of the ones I want are in here. All right, what I have to do is I have to go up to the top, and, and I can put it anywhere, but I always put it right there, and I say using static system.console. All right, and notice when I get down here now, the right no longer is highlighted. Still get an error because it's like right what? So we'll put in here, please, oh, hello. Please enter hours worked. And I'm getting all that because it has to be in double quotes. All right, 
then I need to say hours worked. And notice as soon as I do that, see how the squiggly goes away from there? That's equal to convert dot to double, like we did before, but now we want to convert what we read in. So it's the read line. So that one's done. And I'm going to copy that again because it's pretty similar for the next one. And now I'm going to say, please enter hourly rate. Notice hourly rate is still squiggly, but notice as soon as we change this to hourly rate. All right, now that's no squigglies. Okay, so that's good. All right, now we've got all that stuff done. I think we can copy in our logic that we used from right here. That'll work. All this will work. In fact, as far as I know, everything that's right here, everything that's there will work. If it doesn't, we'll know very quickly. So I'm going to copy it. We don't have to worry now about a clear and an exit because we don't have that here. All right, so we'll, we'll, we'll get to that in just a minute. So we want to come down here then, and I'm going to paste this in. And again, notice I have nothing in my error window here, so it all looks like it's going to work. All right. So the only thing that I have left to do is to print this stuff out. And I decided to do something a little bit different printing this one. I want to show you exactly what I mean. All right. So I'm going to say here, console, boy, oh boy, put your fingers on the right keys. Console dot right line. And I'm going to say here, I'll put a couple line breaks in here, just so it looks a little bit nicer. And I'm going to say, um, you worked, and if you remember, that's that placeholder that we talked about before. So we'll put that in there, so we get some experience using that. And it'll be hours worked. Another console dot right line. Your hourly rate is So that will be hourly rate. And like I said, I, I decided for whatever reason, just to do something a little different here. What I want to do is if the person had overtime hours, I want to print them out. But if they don't have overtime hours, I don't want to print it out. I don't want to say you work zero hours overtime. I could, but it's kind of silly. So I say here if, and this is the if statement, and what goes in those parentheses, which are mandatory, is what's known as a Boolean condition which means it's something that has to go and be either be true or be false. So if OT hours are greater than zero, meaning that the person works some overtime, we, as we calculated it, then we'll say console.writeLine. You worked... Again, we'll use the same we had before. Overtime hours. And that will be OT hours. All right. And then there's no else on here because if, if, it, there's, if it was else, they didn't work any overtime. So one more console dot right line. Your gross pay 
is and we're going to make a couple more quick additions to this in just a minute but I want to run it for you first all right and I see no errors which is always a good sign so I'm going to save it oh remember at the very bottom I need a read line otherwise it's going to fly off the screen all right so let's run this and see if it works we'll we'll use the same ones we used before hours work 40 hourly rate 10 you work 40 it should have said 40 hours your hourly rate is 10 your gross pay is 400 so that's that's pretty good let's run it one more time and let's do it with 50. 10 overtime hours all right your gross pay is 550. all right a couple things i'd like to change here first of all this please enter hours work let's put it back a couple backslash and or one there and one more here because that'll look nicer and then finally where it says your hourly rate is I'm going to put this on another line just so you can all see it okay okay but I, instead of hourly rate I'm going to put hourly rate dot to string and I'm going to put that like this which means I want to take that field and I want that field all right and this should say you work that number of hours. There. All right. And I want to do the same thing with my gross pay. And what that will do is that'll put the dollar sign in there so it'll look a little bit nicer. So I'll say here, That will be gross pay dot to string and again I'll have to put in here C doesn't matter if you use an upper or lowercase C so let's run it one last time there were errors oh I missed the right parenthesis let's try running it again all right so enter hours worked they worked 40 Okay, enter hourly rate, which was $10 an hour. You work 40 hours, your hourly rate is $10, your gross pay is $400. That looks pretty good. Let's run it one more time with 50. So 50 and 10. 10 overtime hours, and your gross pay is $550, just as we calculated it. All right? So if we take this back from the beginning here, this was exactly the same as we had what we had in our GUI program. We are creating program constants, one for the most hours you can work per week without any overtime, and another for the overtime rate. So you saw those, all right? All right, and then next, we had our hours worked, our hourly rate, our gross pay and our overtime hours okay now hopefully all of that stuff that I put in there made sense to you or at least some sense all right okay so here we'll say just putting some extra comments in here input hours worked here we'll say input hourly rate it's a little bit redundant to put that in there. Determine the overtime or not. If it's less than 40, no overtime. So that's what you see there. Otherwise, and there it is. All right. And then finally, display outputs. Okay. And here we'll say only prints overtime hours if individual actually worked oops, overtime, okay? That's it. So what I've shown you in the space of, what, 44 minutes is how to, how to go through a simple if statement, which is what's right here.
all right? I showed you it without the if, and then I added the if, so you could see both of them. So I'm gonna do here a file. Uh, let's just keep it open in case we need it. And we'll go back to the PowerPoints now, and I'm probably gonna go over these fairly quickly. All right, again, the idea behind this chapter, our general objective is to demonstrate C-sharp decision structures. I've hit on some of them. There's another structure that's in here that we have not yet talked about called the switch. We'll get to that in just a couple minutes. So we want to understand logic planning tools and decision making, learn how to make decisions using ifs or an if else, having compound expressions with an if, make decisions with a switch, talk about the conditional, also known as the ternary operator, use the not operator, talk about some common errors that people make when they are working with decisions, and then finally, learn about decision-making issues in GUI programs, all right? All right, I have not shown you pseudocode. I have pseudocode that I've written before. In fact, let me show you what some looks like. All right, this is gonna look a little weird, but um, I've got some pseudocode in here someplace in one of these folders, which I wish I marked a little better. But I've got one of the, some pseudocode in here And I just want to show you what it looks like. one this will work just fine copy it here all right so here is an example of some pseudocode that I wrote here's a comment that explains a payroll program and here's the pseudocode when you look at it you may or may not understand code but pseudocode is kind of a cross between regular English and actual program code. But what pseudocode is known as is being program language agnostic. So in other words, in other words, if I knew five different languages and you gave me the pseudocode, I could write the program in any of those languages. All right. So here's some functions in here also. So there's a lot of stuff in here. So all that would have to be put in here is code. Okay. All right, let's continue on. Flowchart is another way you can do this, but with flowchart, you do it pictorially. Okay. What we've done so far in here is we've used the sequence structure where we go one statement at a time. One follows another, as it says, unconditionally and sequentially. But again, that's not always how life works. Here's pseudocode. All right. As it says, you're going down the road here and you say, is the expressway backed up? If it's not, you want to take it. If it is backed up, you might want to go another route. So this is an example right here of using a flowchart. Okay. And that flowchart showed a decision structure when you had an alternative course of action based on something within the program. And again, the computer, all decisions, as it says right here, are yes, no, known as Boolean in their most reduced form. It is or it isn't. We use just a regular if statement. So if it's true, we do something. If it's not true, we do nothing. I would recommend 
If you only have one statement, you don't have to put it inside of curly braces, but I still recommend always using curly braces. So let's just say, and, and I'm not even going to write pure code here, but just to show you this. Okay, so let's say I would write something like this. If age greater than or equal to 21, and we'll just say here, we'll say print, and don't worry about it. Okay, we'll say right line. Right line, you are of legal age. Okay, now if we ran this, and earlier in our program we had said int age equal 45. Well, 45 is greater than or equal to 21, so it would say you are of legal age. But if the person wasn't 45, but the person was 5, now nothing will print. So an if without an else, if it's true, you'll do this, but if it's not true, you won't do anything. So we might want to write here else. steal this code here. And we'll put in, sorry, you are not of legal age. So the idea when you have an if with an else like this is if you check your condition, if the condition is true, you do what falls be between the curly braces. And there can be more than one line here. If the condition is false, you skip everything in there, and with this else like this, you do this. All right. There's also a third little corollary on here. Okay, so we'll say here, let's change this to if age is greater than 21, you are of legal age. Else, if age equal 21, and we'll put in here right line, Barely legal. And then it else. So if the person is more than 21 years old, like we had one when they were 45, then this is going to execute and we skip all of this. If, as in our second example, the person was five, well, that isn't true. That isn't true. So we do this and we skip the other ones. If the person happens to be 21, we skip that because they're not greater than 21, but we execute this because they are equal to 21, and then we skip this. Now I did that quickly, but hopefully that made some sense to you because that's the logic of using an if statement. There they're showing it to you with a flowchart. All right, so you would end up with code that looks like that based on this. Okay. All right. Again, in this case, since you don't have the curly braces, let's say that number was less than five. So let's say number is two. So we are going to write this then. But since this is not in curly braces, you only do the first statement, but then you always do this. So even if number is not less than five, let's say the number is six, you skip this line here, but you still do this line. You need to use curly braces. All right? Okay, nested if, which is an if within an if. So let's say that what we wanted to do is that we wanted to check if a person could take out a loan. Okay, so I'm just going to put here, I'm going to put a bunch of junk here just to, just to separate this. Okay. Okay. So let's say that. Whoops. For a person to qualify for a loan, they must meet two conditions. I'm making this up. So, one, they must be. 21 years of age or older, very similar to what we had before. Number two, they must make, 
let's say $35,000 a year or more. Okay? There's two ways that we could write this. We could say if age is greater than or equal to 21 and, which is two ampersands, so these both have to be true, and uh, income is greater than or equal to 35,000, so if both those are true, then we write line you qualify. Else we write line sorry you do not qualify. Okay, and that'll work just fine. There's not a problem with that. Okay, so if both of them are true. But another way that we can write this, I'm going to leave this all up there. Hopefully it can all fit on the screen. So another way we could have written this would have been like this. We could have said if age is greater than or equal to 21, then in here we could have put another if that said if income is greater than or equal to 35,000, all right, so we'll be able to give actually more information, I guess is one way to put it, writing it this way. So if the age is greater than or equal to 21, then we check the income. If, if, if this is true, then we check this one. So if these are both true, we do this. Otherwise, we can say, sorry, and we'll put a different message in here. Old enough, income too small, for lack of better words. All right, then we can put in here, else, right line, not old enough to qualify. So what I'm trying to show you here is there's, this has got an if within an if, which is referred to as a nested if statement. So we could have written it as two different ifs like this, or we could have written it as one if that was combined. And another thing to realize is the way that C-sharp works is it uses something that's called short-circuiting, which means it checks this. If, if, if we're an and, they both have to be true. If that's false, it never checks this because it doesn't have to. What if you only had to meet one of these criteria? What if your age had to be 21 or your income was greater than or equal to 35? Then instead of using two ampersands, you use two pipe signs. That's right up above your enter key, like that. So that's or. And now, if this one is true, since it's an or, it never even checks this one. It doesn't have to. So the double ampersand is used for and, and the double pipe sign is used for or. So I just showed you a nested if. This is how you would look at it in pseudocode. This is how you would write it. Notice there is an if within an if there. All right. Re please remember that when you're checking for equality in an if statement or a, a loop, as we'll see in the next chapter, two equal signs. If you use just a single equal sign, that means assignment, not check for equality. This will always be true. All right. I showed you the if else already, so you've seen that. I showed you how you can combine with the and or the or. All right. Now, truth tables, and you can look that up yourself, as it says, they're diagrams that are used in mathematics and in logic to describe whether something is true or whether something is false. All right. If, if you're really interested, I can show you. There's three basic truth tables. 
All right, so I've got all this stuff. Let's just quickly write the truth tables. There are three different things you can write this for. You can write them for and, you can write it for or, and you can write it for not, okay? And when you're writing for and, you can have X and Y, let's say, and they can, one, they can both be false, all right? So if they're both false, then the result is false. Okay, so if this is false and this is false, that means that the whole thing is false. If the first one is false, but the second one is true, remember, it's still false because they both have to be true. All right? If the first one is true, but the second one is false, again, they're still false. Only when both conditions are true is the entire thing true. So that's a truth table for an AND statement. All right? So that's the first one. Let's just copy it because that'll make it a little easier as I'm writing this. So let's do the next one. And this will be for an OR statement. It's going to, in almost, not quite, but almost look just the opposite. If they're both false, it's still false. But otherwise, it's true. That's true. And that's true. Okay, so that's an AND and that's an OR. The last one is called a NOT. And that just has a single condition. That's known as an inverter. So, NOT TRUE equal FALSE. NOT FALSE equal TRUE. Those are your truth tables. Okay? All right, I mentioned this short circuit evaluation to you already. Here's an AND, there's the truth table. I guess I should have just shown what the author had there. I didn't look at these beforehand. There's an example with the AND and the two ampersands. All right. The OR, there's the truth table as I already showed you. And again, it's the double pipe sign. You can combine ANDs and ORs together and use NOTs also if you want to. All right, let's talk about a switch statement, okay? So let's, let's do this. Let, let's, I'm gonna write some code here. Um, let me use that before, let me grab this. Let's say we wanted to say something like this. If size equal equal small, or S, that's good. Then we want to say right line, you're a small. Okay, I mean, this isn't showing a whole heck of a lot, but I, it's, it's more that you have an understanding of what's going on here. All right. Else, if the size is medium, we'll say you're a medium. Else, if the size is L, we'll say that you're a large. Uh, so I'll get another else if. We'll have yet another. Else, if size equals XL, we'll say size equals extra large. Otherwise, so else, we're 
just going to put in here size unknown. Size unknown. And this will work just fine. It's not a problem. That'll work fine. Maybe make this a little bit bigger so you can see what's going on here. There we go. So if size is S, right line you're a small, else if size is M, right that you are medium, else if size is L, right you're a large, else if size is XL, right you're an extra large, else right size unknown. So we're assuming those are the only sizes. Okay? Kind of keep that one in mind because I'm going to go down a little bit here. We could also write that like this. We could say switch on size. We have to put the whole thing in curly braces. And we can say, again, case S. And we would write, right line here is small. And then we want to get out of the case because we're done. So we say the word break. Case M. Right line, you're a medium. And again, we'll do a break. Case L. Hopefully you see where we're going here. Right, you are large, and do a break. Case XL, right, oops, right line, you're an extra large. And break. And then finally, you use the word default, which means if there's nothing else, then you want to do a right line, unknown size. Now, you don't have to technically put at the bottom here, it's the end, you're, you're at the end, but you still can put the word break in. Okay? So when we did it up here, when we did it as an if, and I'll let me make it a little smaller. Okay, so you can see all of it. If, if, if S do this, else if M do this, else if L do this, else if XL do this, otherwise do this. Well, here we're doing virtually the same thing, but we're doing it using what's called a switch. So instead of saying if size equal, we say case. We have to put that break there because that means get it means that you're done. If we were let's say we left out every one of these. So let's say we left out this break and this break and this break and this break. And the person was a small. It would print you're a small, but it wouldn't break, so it would print you're a medium, and it wouldn't break, so it would print you're a large, and it wouldn't break and it would print you're an extra large, and it wouldn't break and it would print unknown size. In other words, it would print everything. All right, and the author does tell you that in here. It tests a single variable against a series of exact matches. I showed you switch, I showed you case, I showed you break, and I showed you default. Whatever you're switching on can be any of these things that you see in here. You don't need a default case, but it's considered good practice to put one in there. All right, it says this fall through is not allowed in C sharp. Okay, so there's their example. Maybe it's better than mine. All right. All right. You can do this, which means if it's a three or if it's a four, do this type of thing. That's okay. You can use enumerations that we talked about earlier. Remember, see now when you say accounting, CIS, etc., it's easier here to say case major accounting as, a, as opposed to case major one, two, three, four, five, etc. All right? All right, let's look at the conditional operator. And the conditional is also called 
the uh, question mark colon operator. So let's go back to the code that we've been writing here. And let's, and I'm, I'm making all this stuff up on the fly. So I'm gonna have make three variables. Int x equals 17. Int y equals 31. Int, and I'm gonna call this last one max, and I'm gonna set that equal to zero. And what I wanna do is I wanna say if x is greater than or equal to y, I want to say max equals x. Else, I want to say max equals y. And that's totally legit. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that code. It'll work just fine. Okay, there it is. And it'll work just fine. If I want a shortcut for that, I can also write it like this. I can say max equal and then check if x is greater than or equal to y, I say question mark, which means if that's true, do this, and if it's false, do this. That's the whole thing. So I've replaced 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 lines of code with one line. This says do a Boolean test. If the Boolean condition is true, take this and assign it, remember single equal sign means assign to that. If it's false, take this and assign it to that. Some people really like the conditional operator. I've read other authors who say never use it. There really isn't a place for it. It's, it's all a matter of opinion. I mentioned not to you, which is used with the exclamation point. Not true is false, not false is true. All right. Common errors, using single equal when you mean a double equal, putting a semicolon at the end of an if, not having the right type of curly braces, maybe you have six left curlies and five right curlies. All right, and being incomplete when you're writing your code in there. When you're doing range checks, so if you wanna see if something falls within range, so if I want to know if a grade is between 0 and 100, you use an AND. So I would say if grade is greater than or equal to 0 and ampersand ampersand grade is less than or equal to 100. So if I'm checking to see if something falls within a range, I use an AND. If I want to see if something falls outside of a range, I use an OR. So if I was checking for an invalid score, I would say if score is less than zero or score, remember or is this right here that you see in red, or score is greater than 100. Okay, I and mean, that's pretty much the same types of examples they're showing here. All right. I showed you the decision. You saw it actually in, in, in both the... Um, GUI program and in the non-GUI program, okay? So here they're saying when age is 11 and rating is G, so I think it's like 12 and under here, for a G-rated movie you get a discount, okay? And then they show you the associated code. So we've gone quickly, it may not have seemed that quick, but fairly quickly over the decision structure. We looked at Pseudocode and flowcharting is logic planning tools for decision making. We used how to use, learn how to use just an if, and if with an else, and if with one or more else ifs with an else. Compound expressions with an if using and and or and not. We went over the switch. We looked at the conditional, which is also called the question mark colon operator. We looked at the not. We looked at some common errors that you'd make when making decisions. And then finally, we kind of brought it all together with talking about some of the stuff in GUI programs. So that is it for chapter four. When I come back shortly, I will be going over chapter five. And chapter, whereas chapter four was on selection, chapter five, I believe it's on repetition also known as looping or iteration. So I will be back with that shortly.